Good morning, everybody. Daniel Spatz from Daniel Spatz Interviews from California. We have a very special guest today, Jimmy Arias, former top five player in the world in 1984. Uh, he lives in Bradenton, Florida. He is the director of uh, IMG Tennis Academy, former NBTA Nick Balatieri. He was one of the first great students, young students that Nick had. Um, Paul Forsythe, thank you for joining and for uh, uh, connecting with, with Jimmy and so many others, Paul. I'm very grateful to you. You helped me a lot to build my channel. I am G Tennis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, give uh, Jimmy Ellis the welcome. And as I said before, he was a former top five player in the world, uh, director of IMG right now, tennis, director of tennis, tennis analyst for Tennis Channel, ESPN. So he knows what he's talking about. So we're gonna listen to him. We're gonna learn from Jimmy. I get the right now and, and ready to go with my guest. Okay, I'm wishing you everybody. Hey, Jimmy. I know what I'm talking about, but I don't know how to do Instagram. So, you know. Come on. No, 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 no. You are. Uh, but now I'm here. Foresight. Yeah, sorry. Took me a second. Jimmy, uh, you were lining fast like your forehand was. Yeah, I wish. I wish. Forehand took me a few years. It all G takes a few years. Jimmy, thank you so much for accepting the, the invitation. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. How are you, Jimmy? I mean, overall, you, you, everybody in this, this is a difficult time, you know, for the world, so. Well, obviously, I live in Florida, and Florida is less difficult as far as at least the COVID situation than everywhere else. Um, we've been pretty free for the most part, and... Um, other than right at the beginning, where things were a little bit difficult. Um, it's been great. The only problem for me is I got COVID two weeks ago. And so I have a little less energy than normal, but I'm feeling better finally today. I'm, you know, I'm here talking to you. So life is good. How, how was it like? I mean, any, any big symptoms you felt or just? So yeah, because I'm an idiot a little bit. What happened was when I was young, I used to, if I felt as though I was getting sick, I would go for a run and go work out and sweat it out. You don't, anyone that catches COVID, don't try that. Um, because I was, after two days, I felt like I'm gonna go for a run and I wasn't feeling that badly and I did that. And um, then I, I went downhill for maybe three or four days, didn't feel great. That's when I really, I hurt myself somehow there. Um, but I, I recovered, whatever, I'm fine, I'm good. Okay, Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, I wanna start talking about the Australian Open. So, yeah. hey, you are the guy, just talk, I don't wanna talk. Um, look, the, the, the annoying part about the Australian Open is from where I live, when it happens, it's kind of middle of the night stuff or very, very early in the morning. And especially on the weekend, I have to admit, I sleep in a little bit. So I didn't get to see the whole match I did not get to see um, the first two sets at all. So I don't know what was happening at the beginning of the match. By the time I started watching the match, the thing that was interesting to me was both players looked like they wanted to shorten points a little bit. Um, Medvedev's strokes, I don't like the way his strokes are produced. They're all arm. So I don't believe he can just rip a winner. He can't unload and hit the ball big enough on one shot to just finish a point. And he needed to because physically he looked tired. So the only answer he had was drop shots to try to finish points sooner. He did try to take the ball maybe a little earlier than I'm used to seeing him. The part that I was watching, he was up closer to the baseline trying to to finish points, maybe with his two-hander occasionally, he can step in, take it early, redirect down the line and get some free points that way. Um, but I thought that the biggest difference was Rafa could just unload with one shot and hit a, and hit a clean winner. And Medvedev obviously needs to work on, he's not gonna change his strokes to be able to produce his own pace and just rip a one ball winner. That's not his game. He's got the big serve that helps him hold serve easily. But in that situation, at some point, he's going to learn how he's going to have to learn how to volley. He can come in and set up 
good positions for himself and shorten points that way. His volley is just too big, floppy, loose, not firm, not able to really knock off volley. So, you know, there's not very many times in Medvedev's life where he's the guy that gets tired first or is tired. I've never seen him tired before. He's a guy that can run all day and, and never gets tired. But for whatever reason, maybe pressure, uh, humidity, whatever it was, he looked like physically he was the one that was hurting, which, you know, when you think about it, Nadal's 35 years old and his strokes take so much energy, the way they're produced. It's amazing to me what he can still do at his age um, and, and last in a match like that. Jimmy, is Rafa, from the competitive point of view, the greatest all time? I mean, yeah, I guess for, if you say as a competitor, yes. Seemingly he has. Um, Andre Agassi actually once said to me, and this was maybe a little bit before Djokovic was so in the equation. You know, mm -hmm. you knew Djokovic was good, but you didn't know he was quite as good as he's, as he's become. But Agassi said, look, if, if you had, because he had told me before Federer was the greatest player. I guess the first time, but this was before Nadal became just as good as Federer. So, mm -hmm. so first it was Federer, and I guess he told me this is the best player I've ever seen, best player ever. So fast forward 10 years, Djokovic and Murray are in the mix. It's Federer and Nadal are still maybe like the two biggest, and those other two are closing in. And it's this time frame. And he said, look, if someone came from another planet and said, we're going to play a tennis match. If you, your champion loses, we are going to blow up the earth. Which guy do you, you, who's your champion? Um, Rafa, uh, Andre said, you got to pick Rafa in that situation because he's the guy that with the biggest comp competitor heart, whatever it is, he's going to fight for the whole planet. That's the guy you want on your side. So, He's basically saying he's what you're saying. He's the greatest competitor of all time. And obviously everyone's always talked about how Nadal's the one guy, even though in this match he might have done that a little differently, and he probably will have to, but he's the one guy that no matter if, if I was playing John Isner and John Isner serving at 40 love, that point is going to be a point that I'm not throwing it away on purpose, but mm -hmm. I'm feeling as though why I'm going to just go for something crazy because I'm probably not breaking serve and why waste any energy? Rafa was the guy who played every point as if it's the biggest point he's ever played, no matter what the score is. And that was one of the things that the players always struggled about playing him was that they felt as though I have to win all four points every game to win the game. Like there's never a, a whew, he gave me something. It's all you having to fight for every point every time. So I think that's uh, that's the reason why he's the greatest competitor. Jimmy, John McEnroe yesterday said, uh, you can't teach that. Somebody probably, you played, right, John, uh, in the yeah. old days. So uh, yeah. are you agree with that? Because everybody, you know, we, we have sports psychologists, mental coaches, whatever you want to call them, helping players. I mean, like, I think there's a whole nature-nurture argument that's getting a little deeper than than just tennis in some ways. I think your nature is the high 90% of the, of the way you are. Um, but I think there is a small percentage of nurture where you can learn to get closer to what Nadal is. So I think there's, it's a nature nurture thing. I think most of it is nature. Most of it is Nadal. He's got it. But I think his family also nurtured whatever it is that allowed him to be the way that he is. Perfect. Uh, you, you started with Nick very young, almost at the beginning of the academy. Um, no, I was here, yeah, before there was the academy. Actually. Before it was the academy, exactly. But uh, Jimmy, uh, also I feel part of the IMG. I, I, I've been there and I love the place. I love everybody. So uh, Jimmy, what, is, what changes Have you seen over the years, the academy back in the 80s, when you were a student, now you have the tennis director. 
Um, well, I mean, the biggest, what's funny is I'm sort of trying to bring it closer to back to what it was at the beginning in some ways as director. So when I got here, it was, first of all, when I got here, there was no academy. Nick was the head pro at a tennis resort in, in this area, Longboat Key, Florida. And the one thing Nick had at that time was a school that mm -hmm. let us go until just noon. So there was no such thing as homeschooling when I was a kid. Everybody went to school till 4 p.m. pretty much. 3 or 4 p.m. was when you got out of school during the school year. So there wasn't as much time to play tennis. Um, Nick had a school that let me out at noon. I was from Buffalo, New York, which is freezing cold in the winter. Playing indoors, not easy to get court time, especially in the 70s early 80s that was sort of when i was growing up that was when tennis boomed a bit and so um nick invited me to come to the colony i'd live at his house go to this school um they let me out at noon and he had two good players mike de palmer and a kid named chris green who were three or four years older than me and so i decided i'm gonna make the move and basically all that we did was play other we just played matches and i then went to kalamazoo i was 13 but i played kalamazoo the u.s nationals mm. and i talked to the top 20 kids in the nation and i told them look we got a place we got a school that that lets us out at noon we can play at some floor yeah we just lost the sound working okay um, I can hear I'm not going to last that long because this phone is, yeah, isn't going to be working for that long. And for some reason, the plug's not powering it. I don't know why. But hopefully I can last long enough. So <laughs> basically, basically what happened was that 15 or so of the top 20 kids in the nation came to the academy. It ended up becoming the Nick Voluntary Tennis Academy. We played matches against each other all day. It was very competitive. One of the things that I hated more than ever. Yeah, we have some issues with the connection right now. Sorry, guys. This is really interesting. I love it, listening to these wonderful stories from these great players, you know. It's very, very nice to hear, to listen, to learn. Uh, I hope uh, things are going to get better soon. Sorry for the convenience. Here is the connection is good. Oh, Jimmy left. Hopefully he, he's going to connect again. So, yeah, I mean, um, hi everybody. Thank you for joining Jimmy Arias, number top five in the world, reached the US Open semifinals, uh, French Open quarterfinals, Davis Cup player, director of tennis IMG, and, and TV analyst, tennis channel ESPN. So thanks everyone for following my channel, my interviews. You have 340 interviews uploaded on my uh, YouTube channel. Plus my video, tennis videos, instructional tennis videos. It's been there for 11 years, 10 years. So I'm very excited to help people to improve their game. You know, that's the most important thing. Um, I'm waiting for Jimmy to, to return. Um, hopefully he will. <laughs> I'm very optimistic. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think we, we do the best we can to bring great people, coaches, players, uh, psychologists, fitness, and everybody, you know, that, and not just tennis people, also people from other fields. Sorry, we lost the communication with Jimmy Arias in Bradenton, Florida. So he was, we were having a nice talk for 15 minutes, and then you know, the connection was lost. So I will probably leave right now and I will join you in, in a few minutes, okay? Uh, thank you so much. Don't don't go, oh, IMG is again. IMG is again. He's back. Okay, waiting for Jimmy to reconnect. There you go. I'm back. Sorry about that. 
Jimmy, but, uh, you you went to the to the bathroom break. <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish that was all it was. Hopefully, this new wire will stay keeping this phone that I'm on charge. You are fine. You are absolutely fine. I was talking to the audience in the meantime. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, you were telling me the changes. Uh, do you wanna you wanna have, bring the academy okay. some so point? What I was telling you basically was the beginning of the time. The main thing that we did was we all competed with each other. The top 20 kids came to the academy. Nick got funding to build the place where it is now. And nothing was worse for me than you play a practice match against, let's say, Paul Anacone, who was in my class. And if I lost to Paul um, and the rest of the kids would go, Jimmy, how'd you do with Paul? They, oh, you lost. And that's where, so every match, every practice was like a tournament in some ways. You did not, you, everyone wanted to be the top dog when we were all together. I'm and, sorry, Jimmy, uh, uh, any South American player that, that was training there? Yes, Pablo Raya was mm. the guy from Peru. And he was actually, I use him still often in when I talk to the kids today because when I first came to Florida, the first final, the first term I played, I played Pablo in the finals. In those days, tiebreakers were called nine-point tiebreakers, first to five, win by one. And four all in the tiebreak in the final against Pablo, he gives me a bad call. And, <laughs> and I say, come on, Pablo. And he doesn't respond to me other than to go. He put his arms over his head, shook his butt in a <laughs> circle, and said, ole, ole, and danced in a circle, which my brain exploded. And I lost seven six six two because Ooh. of that. And then we play again in a final maybe three weeks later. And it's four all in the third set, my serve. And I'm bouncing the ball. And he goes, hey, hey. And I look up at him. And he points to me. I was short. He points to me and shows me how short I am. He goes, you, short. And then, <laughs> like, he stepped on me um, wow. with his foot. And that worked. I lost 6-4 in the third. <laughs> Lord, they get. Twice in a row. Um, and I remember he, hadn't, he wasn't yet at the academy. And then he came to the academy a few weeks later. He decided to join this whole group of, of good players. And I told the coaches, I want to play him as much as I can because he gets in my head and I want to be stronger. And I know that it's going to help me. It's just going to help me to play with him. And, you know, nowadays I have students and they play someone that they think cheated them or made fun of them. And they, I don't ever want to play that guy again. So I try to tell them the story of you're trying to get stronger. This is something that's difficult that you don't enjoy. The only way to get stronger, learn to overcome it is to face it, to go do it as much as you can. Um, so that's, so what happened after that time, that early time, and I would say, The next big group was Agassiz, Courier, David Wheaton, those guys. And they obviously did even better than, than my group of guys did. Um, they also just beat each other up in matches for the most part. They just played each other and they were not nice to each other. Um, they wanted to be the top dog, same thing. But as time went on, it seemed to me that coaching tennis changed to more of your stroke production, how you're feeling. Let me feel, feed you balls. Mm -hmm. A lot of tennis coaches to me, I hate to say, and I understand, I guess, is you, you make your living, someone paying you for lessons. So you feel like you have to really make sure the stroke looks nice, but you also are afraid that if you tell them to compete and they don't do well, that mm -hmm. they're gonna quit and you're going to lose some of your income. So there's some coaches that sort of dissuade you a little bit from competing and just want you to you know, feel, look at how good you're hitting it. I'm going to feed it to you right here. Stroke is beautiful, Bob, but you don't have any idea how to play. So that's sort of my, I'm trying to bring, and I would say the Academy would have had a little bit of that at a certain amount of time, you know, during the 40 years that the Academy's been here, there would have been a certain period of time when they lost a little bit of that competition. It was more, let's, let's make sure they feel good 
um, and I'm bringing back competition, basically, since I've become director. I want, I feel like players play, players compete. If you, mm-hmm. if you want to be a player, you got to compete and you got to be embracing that competition. You got to want that competition. You want to be, that's what you're doing in the end. You don't want to be the greatest driller, the greatest looking guy when I feed you the ball. You want to be the one that figures out how to win. I also use my little brother. I love using my little brother as an example. My little brother, seven years younger than me. My dad is a crazy tennis parent. Um, But my youngest brother, when he was five years old, fainted. They went and took him to the hospital. He had a brain tumor that was supposedly inoperable. And he was going to die in 10 years. It was a very slow growing tumor. And in 10 years, he would die. My dad still made him play tennis just to give you an idea how crazy tennis parent my dad was um my brother decided well i've only got 10 years to live so i'm just gonna have as much fun as i can have in life he was mad that my dad still made him go to school um because what what does he need to learn for him i've only got 10 years to live but from a tennis standpoint he enjoyed making his opponent angry. That was the great, that was the most fun thing he could do. So he would start every match when he was a little guy just hitting moon balls. And if the opponent said, you pusher, he would go (laughs) and just hit moon balls and enjoy the other guy losing his mind. And um, when he played me, he would, he knew that I wanted some rhythm. So he just serve volleyed and took my first serve, bunted it and ran in. So there was never a rally and I would complain, come on, let's get in a rally. He'd just run in it <laughs> and make me angry and giggle while he's doing it. He ended up having that brain tumor removed when he was 12. They got better at operating and he had an AT, he got ATP points. He never cared about his own game at all. His only focus was just annoying his opponent. That was all he tried to do. He never cared so much about becoming a pro tennis player either. He just, he would play, he would teach a little bit, make some money, and then go play the Hawaiian satellite because he wanted to go to Hawaii or the Australian satellite because he wanted to see Australia. Wherever he wanted to go, he used it as sort of a vacation and occasionally get points. He never changed that attitude. And I use him as an example because I feel as though players today, partly because of the way we've been coaching over the years, are so self-focused that they don't recognize that their opponent, they're, they're playing their opponent and you need to figure out what your opponent doesn't like also. Obviously you start with your own game, but if that's not working, if your game plays into your opponent's strengths, your job is to make your opponent uncomfortable in some ways. So I'm trying to teach my kids here that combination of let's build your game, let's find out what your strengths are set up the patterns so that you get your shot that you like to finish with more often. If it's not working, let's figure out how to annoy your, your opponent. Cause in the end of the day, you're trying to figure out how to win. Uh, People in the audience are enjoyed a lot. You started with your brother. I love it too. Thanks Amy for sharing that. It's touchy. I mean, it was very emotional. Uh, Talk about Nick Balletier, Jimmy. I mean, who was Nick in your life? That one's always been strange for me because by the time I came here, I was number one in the nation and I had a different game. Um, I was sort of that very first, my, my father, I took a lesson when I was seven. <coughs> Sorry, I still left over COVID. Um, took a lesson when I was seven and the guy told me, get sideways, take the racket back shake hands with a racket, which was like kind of a continental grip that you would have had with the way he had me shake hands, take the racket straight back, turn sideways, hit, point the follow through at your target. My dad didn't know anything about tennis at that time. He was an electrical engineer. And I came off the court, I was six or seven when I took that lesson, I came off the court, I said, dad, what'd you think? He's from Spain, so he had an accent. He goes, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, how can you swing full speed and stop? That means you slow down during the hit. Um, So he designed my forehand 
scientifically in some ways. He wanted me to take the racket back with my left arm, which gets you to turn right away. My right arm, he wanted completely relaxed. He wanted the racket head pointed up. So that's where you get the momentum. He wanted momentum. And so by the time I came to Nick, I already had this sort of more modern game that was different than what people were teaching and what people were doing for the most part. And to Nick's credit, most of the people that saw me would say a number of things on why I wasn't going to be as good as I am right now is because number one, I'm too small. Number two, I'm never going to swing that fast under pressure. Um, number three, I'm going to hurt my arm swinging mm. away with swinging at the ball. Nick saw that forehand, came, came running out on the court, and he brought all his coaches over, come here, and he goes, that's the ball of Terry forehand. <laughs> <laughs> he Which, put a stamp there. Yeah, he put a stamp on that. He goes, that's the right way to hit it. That's the ball of Terry forehand. So there's a part of me that's always been like, it's kind of like the Antonio Arias forehand, really. But yeah. but Nick Nick put his stamp and Nick got it and Nick started teaching it. And Nick became Nick. And one of the things that Nick had on top of teaching everybody my freaking forehand, one of the other things that that Nick was great at was motivating you in different ways depending on your personality. So I had a father that just told me how much I stink every day. And that was okay for me when I'm young, especially because my personality was, what are you talking about? I stink. Let me show you. I don't stink. I'm good. So it made me want to compete and all that sort of stuff. But at some point you start getting beaten down a little bit with you're no good. Mm -hmm. And I think Nick sensed that right away with me. So he just told me how great I was every, every day, pretty much. And I kind of liked hearing, hey, this guy thinks I'm great. Uh, and man, you did pretty well. Top five in the world. Whatever. None <laughs> of that stuff matters to me because it's not where I want it to be. I did a podcast with Matt B. Launder not so long ago, and it was an interesting one for me because I've always thought, and I told kids this too, and now I'm sort of rethinking it a little bit, to set your goals really high. And the, the reason I thought I did as well as I did or was because when I was eight years old, I decided I was going to be number one in the world. Eight and years I, old. Eight years old, I made the decision. I remember it like, I'm going to be number one in the world, and I believed I would do it, 100%. There was not even a smidgen of doubt in my mind that I mean, maybe that's how eight-year-olds think. I don't know. But I just knew I'm going to do what it takes. Mm -hmm. Whatever it takes to be number one, I'm going to do it. So, um, And then for my part of the story, I actually changed my mind when I was 18 years old and ranked five in the world, which is – this is a decision I would love to have back. I got sick with mono. I had three months in bed because I played a little bit too long with the mono and realized I'm in trouble. I was, my spleen was enlarged. Um, maybe I needed three months to rest before they even let me start hitting a couple of balls. So I had too much time to reflect on what I'd done to that point. And one of the thoughts that I had was number one in the world is too famous for my tastes. I'd like to go to a movie and nobody knows who I am. You know, five is perfect. I make decent money. Some people know who you are because it's a niche sport at number five. But for the most part, I'm anonymous in the real world. And you can never, those of you, you can never hope to stay where you are because people are going to keep passing you. That's basically what happened. I played scared after that. But what Mats Vilander said that was different than me that I actually thought was genius and wish I had thought the way he did. He said he never thought about being number one in the world. He never cared. He never mm. had that thought. His joy, he enjoyed com actually figuring out how to beat the player that he was playing that day. That was, he goes, all I, I enjoyed that process of playing and then trying to see what's going to work. How can I figure out how to beat the guy I'm playing today? He goes, I knew if I did that enough times, if I was figuring it out over and over again, that ranking good things would happen. But my focus was just the joy of, 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 that, of that competition and figuring out how to beat the guy I'm playing. Made it a lot simpler and also gave you that sort of in the moment thing. Like even if you're playing the finals of the French Open when you're 17, 
I'm going to have a thought in my head of I'm going to I want to be number one. I got to I got to win this match to have my career. He's just doing what he does every day. I just trying to figure out today how I beat that guy. So it's maybe part of the reason why he was able to play the big matches without you never noticed any any nerves for Mats Vilander. So he he perfected that. I think his way was genius. Uh, Jimmy, college or pro? I mean, is the million dollar question. Everybody is going crazy in junior times, you know, junior tennis, uh, making the big decision of their life, you know, going to pro directly, skipping college. What, what, what would you advise them? That's an interesting one, obviously talking to me because I was kind of the first guy that turned pro and didn't, McEnroe made semis of Wimbledon and went one year to college, just to give you an idea of that time frame. And no one was supposed to turn pro without going to college then. That was another thing that Nick did for me. I would not have turned pro. That was not even entering my head when I was 15. That's when I did it. Um, <clears throat> I had a win in an exhibition match against Eddie Dibbs, a one set exhibition, meaningless to Eddie, obviously. I'm 15, I beat him. Nick, I come off the court and Nick goes, that's it. We're turning pro. I love like, <laughs> that. What are you talking about? Like, what you... And and thankfully I did that because my best, you know, years were till I was 15 to 18 were my best three sort of times. So thanks, Nick, for that. Um, so you would think I'm going to tell you you should turn pro is basically. But the answer to the question to me is actually – not that difficult it is you don't turn pro unless you're having success already in the pros if you are not winning futures at that age at the the senior year of high school if you're not winning futures go ahead and go to college we, winning futures yes so when you are Seven, when you are 16 17 that, Finals winning futures, yes. You can't be losing in the qualies. You can't be a 13 or 14, 12, 13, 14 UTR and think I'm just going to keep working because a couple of things. One, wherever you're playing, you make a habit of what you're doing. So one of the big mistakes I see is people always trying to play up and losing a lot. Um you make a habit of losing eventually and, and you're never going to find your way of winning. So like, for instance, I got some crap because when I was 12, I played the 14 and unders and everyone gave me a hard time about that. But I won, I was number one in the nation in the 12s the year before the next year I was number one in the nation in the 14s when I was 12. So the next year I played 16s to me until you master each level till you're the best in your level, you don't move up just to take pressure away from, from playing your age group or your lesson, or that's just ego based protecting yourself. I didn't feel bad playing up when people would give me crap because I said, I already finished number one. What do you like? What do you want me to do? Finish one again? It doesn't, I want to go up and see what I can do higher. So that was a, <clears throat> if you do it that way, I'm okay with it, but I don't like, protecting your ego by only playing up and saying, I'm going to be a pro when you're losing in the qualifying, you don't have an ATP point and of futures. If you're doing that, go play your college. Colleges allow you in the fall to play futures and they pay for it mm. for you to go. They send a coach and you go play some futures. <clears throat> so until you're doing well in those tournaments, you stay in college. That's You go to college and you stay in college. If you're doing well in the futures, there's at least a level of the pros that you know you're winning. You're winning matches. I want you to win matches. I want you to make a habit of winning. So if you're able to win enough matches in the futures, go ahead and turn pro. The same GB for boys and girls. The girls, the girls thing annoys me, I got to say, because I feel as though... I don't like the rules of mm. limiting your tournaments. So if you're good enough at 14 or 15 years old, which there are girls I think that are, that could be winning and could be winning money and could be on the regular tour. You know, there's, there's probably 
a number of, of Coco Goffs or what, you know, mm -hmm. that can't play a full schedule. And then the pressure is enormous because you only get a few tournaments. So you better win them um, rather than being able to play a full schedule. So I struggle on the, the women's side on, on recommending what you do. I mean, I, I think it's a similar thing. You should be, it's the same thing as far as you better be winning at that ITF level in, in the girls um, if you want to turn pro. But I hate that you're stopped even if you are good enough, it's, it's so much extra pressure because you only have a, a finite small number of tournaments that they allow you to play at different age groups. Jimmy, Jose Guerras told me in an interview that every time he played Bjorn Borg, he felt, there's no way I can beat this guy. Uh, how about you? Which player made you feel that, Jimmy, if any? <clears throat> um... I don't think anyone made me feel quite as much as I know, because I talked to Jose one time about Borg. And he told me that he looked over at him one time and Borg was staring at him and his whole body got cold. Like, Borg obviously had influence over Higueras that was, that was next level. I mean, I know that when I played McEnroe, that the problem is I played him in 84, which is the year he only lost two or three matches. That was the year I played him three or four times. And that year I knew I had no chance because he was taking my first serve, bunting it deep in the corner and coming into net every point. And it was a relentless sort of exactly what my little brother would do to me. There was no rhythm at all. And he did it really well. And if he continued to do that, I didn't have answers for that. So that, that year, I knew there was no chance I could, I could beat McEnroe. And the other guy that sort of drove me crazy was Edberg because I had a terrible high backhand return off a slow kick if you serve and volleyed. And Edberg did that relentlessly and literally would get an inch from the net. I mean, it was got to the net so quickly, my backhand wasn't good enough from up here to cause him any problem. So, but even then I had a chance one time I played him. This is where, this is shows you how important the mind is and how nuts mm -hmm. I was by the end of my career. So I've lost to Edberg 20 times and I'm playing him and I decide, you know what? Why do the same thing every time? Let him hit that kicker to my backhand and come in. I'm going to run in and half volley his serve. And we're going to have a fast exchange up at the net and I had never taken a set in all the matches we played and mm. I'm up five one it's working unbelievably well five one break point and I hit another perfect half volley off his serve he barely gets to it he pops it up I have a short forehand inside the service line with him at the net and I decide to get cocky and I look left and hit it right <laughs> and I missed it wide and in my head goes, wouldn't that be amazing if you lost this set now? And as soon as my mind said that, I, f I actually had a physical reaction. It's the first time I ever had the feeling of choking. I got hot is the best way to explain it. I got flush mm. and I couldn't play. And I lost in straight. If you saw the score, it's just like every other score, seven, six, six, four, or six, three, that, that match. Um, just to show you how important the mind is. Jimmy, it's a pleasure listening to you. I have three more questions. I know you're busy. You have a meeting soon. Um, and I let you go. I appreciate your time. Um, the best... With a parent, so if I miss it, like... No, I'm just kidding. It's good. Yeah, I love it. No, no, I mean, it's, 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 it, for me, it's a gift as a tennis coach uh, listening to someone like you. Uh, and uh, let me ask you about uh, USA Tennis. Uh, uh, I've seen is visible the European domination in the 70s, 60s, 80s, USA and Australia, right? And mm -hmm. a few Europeans and Villas, Villas maybe yeah. from, but why Europe is dominating, especially, you know, uh, men's tennis, because uh, women's tennis, uh, USA is going good. Um, well, I think there's a combination of a few factors. I, I think one is, Tennis in Europe is probably more popular, higher on the list of popular sports um, than it is in the U.S. So they get 
some of their better athletes playing tennis, whereas U.S., the best athletes are football and football probably more so than, than running to the tennis side. Um, I feel as though one other factor is, is things are easy in America and tennis is not an easy sport. To become mm -hmm. great, it takes, to me, tennis is the hardest sport there is. Um, maybe that's self-serving since I've lived through it, but it is one-on-one. -on -one. No one likes to admit that their opponent, their man they're playing against, woman is better than them. No one likes to admit that. So there's a lot of emotions as you play. Um, everyone's ego starts looking for a, for sort of a, an excuse or a way out if it feels as though you might mm -hmm. lose. Um, so you have to be very strong from that standpoint, mentally, emotionally, and then you have to be a great athlete. You have to create, you have to practice a skill. Tennis is a skill, all the strokes that take years of sacrifice, mm -hmm. practice, practice, hours to become proficient in those skills. It's just, it makes tennis the hardest to put all those things together that you need. You need to be an athlete. You need to be mentally really strong and you have to have discipline to do s the same thing over and over and over until you get it. Those things aren't easy to find. And I think Americans aren't used to, to putting in that kind of effort for an unknown. Because in the end of the day, it's, you don't know. Well, you put all this time and work into it, you don't know if you're going to make it. I told you I was sure, which is probably the reason that I made it, because I was willing to, to put in that work and do whatever it took. And I knew that this is the on it. But I don't know that that many Americans are, are willing to do that these days. But what do you think about the new wave of, uh, you know, the Opelkas, the Gordas, the Afo, these guys? You see someone stepping up and winning a Grand I mean, Slam soon? There's no reason. It's tough for Opelka in the Grand Slams because three out of five sets at seven feet tall. Hmm. Better win pretty easily because you play five setters. I don't think your body recovers. So that makes it tough for Opelka. Having said that, he should be top 10 in the world at at some point because his game is ridiculously mm. annoying to play against his serve is huge he actually returns reason of his, his backhand is a legitimate very good backhand and he's actually lightning fast in a sprint he can't change directions as well as some but but he's actually pretty athletic um his biggest issue i told you in tennis you need all those things mm. his biggest issue is sort of emotional and and mental one of my favorite opelka stories was i happened to be sitting in he was playing john isner in atlanta and i was sitting in john isner's player box and opelka had sort of dominated the whole match but of course the score was still seven six six seven five six opelka no breaks of serve but all the chances had been opelka's Um, he was making a lot of returns. John wasn't making that many returns throughout most of that match. All of a sudden, at five, six in the third, 15 all, Opelka double faults twice. So 15 40 double match point for Isner. Opelka comes to get his towel, which is literally because he's seven feet tall, it's, mm -hmm. he's right in front of me. <laughs> by two, and he's just saying the same thing over and over to himself as, he's, as he gets to the towel. He's, saying, I should have played team sports. I should have played team sports. He's saying that over and over wow, again. Look. Where his brain is. Now, he did end up hitting two aces, and he got out of that game, and he won, he won tiebreak in the final set. But it's, that statement is the reason he's not already in the top 10, in my mind, is that emotionally he struggles with this sport and this competing and the whole one-on-one -on -one situation. So... He's got that issue. I think Francis Tiafo, Tommy Paul, mm. um, great talents they have. They could become great players. I don't know that they're willing to, to dedicate themselves the way Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, those guys dedicated their whole, they don't do anything but 
what's best to become the greatest tennis player they can be. I don't know that those two guys are willing to go to that length. And that's the problem is you're talking about the whole world, number one, number two, number three in the whole world. Those there's, there's a handful of people that are willing to put it all there on the line. And if you're not one of them, you're not going to make it. Nick Kyrgios, an example of a guy who had he put all everything into mm -hmm. becoming the greatest, I think he'd have a chance to at least be talking about winning grand slams and instead he's 120 in the world. So last two, Jimmy, and I let you go. Uh, the best South American player you ever seen. That one's tough because you talk like, okay, let, we'll talk about my era. Cause it's hard for me to, to talk about, I don't know, like Del Potro. You know, he, I think Del Potro would have been in the mix of those great Federer. He, he would have, they wouldn't be having 21, 20 and 20 if Del Potro had been healthy. Cause Del Potro is the one guy that could consistently beat those guys too when he's playing well. <clears throat> um, so my era was sort of Vilas, Clerk, um, and I actually thought I played both of those guys, and I thought when Jose Luis Clerk was good mentally, mm -hmm. feeling confident, that he was close to unbeatable for me. He had huge power off every wing with when no one did. He had a huge backhand, ripped his forehand, had a big first serve, moved reasonably well, was a pretty big guy. And Vilas was just this mental giant, sort of. Mm. You know, heavy topspin would be willing to stay there almost forever. Borg was one more forever, more than him. That's why when they played each other, they played for six hours and Borg would win pretty comfortably usually. But I mean, those two guys, I think um, Gustavo Kierden was great. I think, I actually think Guillermo Cora, Coria was amazing until he couldn't hit a serve in the court. And I know he wasn't the greatest of all time, but I loved watching him play. Now, Bandian was a guy that was sort of hanging in there with Federer early in his career. Um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously forgetting. Andres Gomez won a French Open. Um, Forgetting obviously some players, so I don't want to. I don't want to mention South Americans and not name a few. No, yeah, and someone who went to the academy, Marcelo Rios, right? Marcelo Rios was an amazing player, but he annoys. He's one of the guys I get annoyed if you have amazing talent mm. and you don't quite take advantage of the talent you have. That that's something that, for some reason, it hurts me. That's why when I talked about Kyrgios, it I I get angry about what he's done and rios would be close not quite as bad as Kyrgios in my mind but he didn't do what he was capable of doing in tennis and i don't know why it hurts me it has nothing to do with me but it does almost bother me in some ways that he didn't he didn't put it all on the line great hey, jimmy the last one advice to the parents because it's something that uh, always brings a lot of controversial You know, right. the, advice to the parents, this is going to, I've got two, two things, two things I would say. Number one, when they're young, and this is my own theory, this is, this is Jimmy Arias, not a thing, but one of the things that I thought that my father did well was, and I'm not recommending this for all of you, but we've been told that the most important thing is people's self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And my ear has told my kids self-esteem is the most important thing. So you tell them they're doing great. You're doing great. Here's a trophy for just playing, blah, blah, blah. I think that fills kids with fear because deep down inside, you know whether you're great or not. And you know you're not great when you're just getting participation trophies. So you're afraid to compete because if you go compete, your parents are telling you how great you are. If you go compete and lose, maybe your parents aren't going to think you're great anymore. So you'd rather not even put it on the line. This is, again, my own theory. Um, my father was the exact opposite of that theory. He told me how much I stink every day, as I told you. <laughs> and I, my personality was, what are you talking about? Let me show you that I don't stink. So 
obviously there's a balance there, but I'm just saying, I don't think the tell your kids they're great, fix all their problems whenever there's an issue. You don't let them face the consequences of a bad mistake, you fix it. All those things to me are you're doing a disservice to your kid and you're not allowing them to, life is hard in the end. So you gotta be able to deal, you gotta build character and you don't build character with those two things. So I would stay away from that. And then the other advice I would have is there's a certain point in time when you're, if you're wanting to create a tennis player, the parent is very involved when they're young because it's hard to push yourself to the level it takes. Again, tennis is the hardest sport. So I think a parent needs to know when to let go. There's a certain point in time when you're pushing them, you're in charge, and at about 13 or so, it's time for you to hand them off, find a coach that you trust that you think is there. You can stay in the background and watch, but you have to be able to disentangle yourself slightly from the situation. Don't don't hover as much and let the let your child's game sort of flow and and learn on its own. I think sometimes they make the mistake, parents, of staying on top, on top, on top, on top, and at some point the kid kid's naturally going to break away, and you got to let them break away even with their tennis as well. Jimmy, thank you so very much. I had an amazing time again. As I said before, that was a gift to my. My, my personal gift that I'm sharing with everybody. Thanks, Jimmy. I hope you've had a good time. Be good. Yes, it was fun. It was fun. Come, come to IMG. I'll take care of your kids. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, 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 and I hope uh, we, we, I meet you also. We, we're going to have All a right. coffee and keep talking about tennis. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Jimmy. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm going to blow the interview, okay, soon. All right. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Good morning.